my wardrobe malfunction, we've had Mel Rogers, Kristen Scott Thomas, Elizabeth Hurley, but I can genuinely say that I am more excited about our next guest than I have been about all of those put together because today I'm speaking to Ruth Davidson. Um, Ruth, you're here. I can't believe it. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, I have to say you're reading out that list of people who are regularly in glossy magazines and everyone remembers the Liz Hurley dress and, and the, the kind of the English patient uh, wardrobe from that period that Kristen Scott Thomas had. And, and I'm just going, what on earth am I doing talking to you about clothes? Because I know nothing about clothes. But that's, that's the beauty of it. That is the beauty of you. And um, it's, it's, I just think that, that A, because of uh, the success that you've had, the arena you're in, your personal life, someone like you is so much, you're bigger than the sum of what you wear. So for me, and it's kind of like, I'm going to be so interested to find out whether you actually give a shit about clothes or <laughs> whether it's, you know, you, you dress, because I've noticed that you, you always dress in block colours, don't you? Yeah. I do. I've never seen you in a print. No, I, I have. I have prints, but for work, I tend to wear a dark suit and like quite a, quite a colourful. As you can see, I do. I do like colour. Um, quite a colourful kind of uh, cami top or vest top or something like that. So yeah. I think I'm. I'm so unsure about clothing, and I, and I do like. I do like clothes, and I like shopping and all the rest of it. But I'm so unsure that I like safe space. Yeah. And. And I've always liked uniforms, um, not in a fetish or a you can't go through my personal <laughs> history kind of a way. But, you know, at, at school, I never minded wearing a school uniform. And I was in the, the uh, territorial army for quite a while. So, I've, you know, I'm, I'm good at ironing creases into trousers. Um, and I, I like when I'm sure of what I'm doing. So in a work setting, I can wear a trouser suit and that's fine. And I'm, yeah. I'm never going to be caught out. Uh, I, I quite like black tie functions. I know what a long dress is. I quite like frocking up, you know, very happy with that. Where I struggle is the in-betweens. So yeah. um, smart casual sends me into paroxysms of I don't know what that means. And I once, when I first got elected, I was once invited down to one of these horrible things you have to do um, to help raise money for political parties, uh, a party fundraiser in London, and it was cocktail dress. And it turns out that what my idea of a cocktail dress is and what people in a very fashionable, very rich, smart set of London's idea of what a cocktail dress is completely different. And I felt like somebody's country cousin. All I was missing was the stalk of corn coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and I just felt, I just felt horrendous. What and were I you just, wearing? What were you wearing? I, I, was, I was wearing like just a little black dress sort of to, to knee length and stuff, which I, I thought was what a cocktail dress. I, I don't go to many cocktail parties, I have to say. It wasn't really part of my, um, like my life before this. Um, but, you know, I, there was an awful lot of people that were wearing very, very stylish things and not something that was bought from the high street for 50 quid, you know. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe I didn't accessorise enough. Maybe that's what I should have done. No, because uh, a little look at Aud someone like Audrey Hepburn, you know, she lived and died in a little black dress and she was considered the most stylish person in the world. Yeah, I'm not Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> 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 Fair enough, Ruth. I, I think you've got to have an insouciance to wear things like Audrey Hepburn, and I maybe don't have that. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, I, I so hear you when you say you've kind of, you, you've created this uniform for yourself. And, and I, you know, having looked at photographs and read articles about you, it's so clear that you have that, that uniform. And it's like I said, it's block colours, it's, it's navy, black, sometimes grey and red. And uh, red, orange orange and pinks so I usually wear red orange pinks or a light blue underneath a, a navy suit yeah. But, but yeah and, and it's just because I don't know any better I'm not confident and it's, when not, I, I, it's not some kind of protection you don't wear that as some kind of protection or is it just because well I think I don't know what the well are. I think well partly the, the navy and black I mean actually if you go kind of further back to older pictures of me um I would wear skirt suits um, with boots in the, the winter and I would wear other coloured suits. When I got pregnant and then when I had my child um, and couldn't shift the baby weight, I only had two suits that fitted me that were a navy suit and a black suit. So, so there is like a, a, basically a year and a half period where uh, I was refusing to throw out any suits that I couldn't fit anymore or buy any more in the next size up. So I literally just did wear the only ones that were roomy enough for me. Yes. So I, 
and it was because I didn't want to be looked at because I was heavy and all that sort of stuff, which I think a lot of people. Yeah, uh, we all identify. All, 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 all women identify with yeah. that. Michael. When you're when you're in the when you're in the really fat end of your wardrobe, like that's that's a difficulty, and and you don't you don't want looked at. So but so do you divide your wardrobe up like that? So you have it in kind of sizes. Are you that organised? I don't believe you are. No, no, I'm not. But I know exactly which suits are at the tighter end of yeah. the size that they are and which ones are at the, the wider end. So um, I kind of, my, my, I've got, um, weirdly, it's in my spare room, I've got a kind of clothing reel. My, my partner's uh, brother used to um, have sports shops over in Ireland. Uh, and when we moved into this house, which we haven't done anything with and we need to, um, there wasn't enough hanging space in it. So instead of like getting fitted wardrobes and paying for all of that, we you know paid for IVF instead uh, so I've got like just a blank clothing reel in my spare room which has sort of shirts dresses skirts and then just suits yeah <laughs> and then everything else is just in drawers uh yeah. so yeah but you've always paid attention to your makeup you are you you always wear great lipstick <laughs> and you do your eyes really well and you pluck your eyebrows you've got good shape eyebrows i do pluck my eyebrows because i'm so dark that if i don't you know i, I can kind of I, be, I can become the third gallagher pretty quickly if i don't <laughs> uh so i i have to do that but um also I, again with makeup I, I wear the same makeup so it's always a kind of brown shimmery um eyeshadow yeah black black mascara um sort of I, I wear a kind of a cream foundation and then I put powder on top just to make it matte because because we have so many kind of cameras both yeah. sort of, um, film cameras and, and, and snapper cameras um you can't be sweaty you just and particularly politicians like you look as if you really are lying if you're sweaty which is yeah. why I would I always yeah. say to men you know don't be you know don't be proud about this wear makeup on camera to find yeah. your eyes because I used to work in tv as well before yeah. so I well not really I was mostly in radio but I did a little bit of television and, and one of the cameramen there was the one that got me started on block colors he was like you know it will pop so it used to be scarves I just used mm -hmm. to have a really bright scarf with you know a, a nice coat um, I, I kind of like winter better than summer because it's easier to dress mm. uh, and you know I've, I've tried to get some of my male colleagues to not be quite so west of Scotland male about it like mm. nobody's going to worry about you know your predilections if you put mm. a little bit of mascara or eyeliner on just so so you're on the telly you just don't look like a blank page but um, mm. I still have some way to go in that but that's, I mean, that must be very difficult in the political arena because I suppose it's a bit like a woman working in the city, where it certainly was sort of in the 80s, mm -hmm. about, because women in the, in the 80s, they'd go to the city and they'd go to their banks or whatever and they'd dress in pinstripe suits, literally, to fit in. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that in politics, there's still a way behind. I, I mean, do you find that you have to dress in quite a sensible, <sighs> masculine, not masculine, but... Oh. I mean, I think, I mean, honestly, I mean, I think um, if I wasn't in the public eye, I think there would be more times that I'd wear things that perhaps were a bit more masculine uh, because actually I like men's clothes. And yeah, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm, I don't know where I would really fall, you know, being a gay woman, I don't know where I would really fall. I'm clearly not a high femme, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm really down the, the kind of the other end of a of, of, of very, um, very butch lesbian either. Um, yeah. But I, I like, you know, so this, this is what I would wear yeah. for fun, is I'm in a pair of black jeans and a set of brogue boots and a shirt. Um, yeah. She's probably a, a, a bit more masculine, I think. I, I And certainly when I was first elected, I was the first... Um, openly gay leader of a major political party anywhere in the UK. I wore a lot more Legend. skirts and dresses yeah. um, with a jacket on top um, because I thought I had to and not scare the horses a little bit. Yeah. And, and I would wear, I was a bit lost actually, I wore kind of chunkier necklaces and stuff like that that's, that's just not me. I, I just, you know, I like a bit of bling when I go to like a black tie event or something you like that. You went down the Theresa May route with her <laughs> big necklaces. Um, not that big. Okay. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> but like I, I had like a bit of paste and stuff around the neck and, and had some pearls and stuff. But to be honest, it's just, I think people just prefer you if you're just yourself. People know yeah, if you're totally. trying too hard. So just totally. Yourself. But I mean, I think, I, I think I, I leave in March, so I've not got long left. And I, I think that I probably will on occasion go to a black tie event in, in a woman's tux. 
um, so cool. rather than an address as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I would mix it up more that way and, and be a bit braver. Yeah. And also, like, I've turned 40 now. I care less. Like, the cartoonists have made every single fat joke they can about me. So I kind of don't care anymore. So yeah. I want to enjoy, like, I'm also happier with myself and in myself than I've ever been. And I think that's one thing that makes older women so attractive, just generally. Yeah, is confidence. That, is that confidence and that sense of self and growing into yourself and just owning yourself. And mm. I think I own myself so much better than I ever used to. Mm. And I'm not lost and in my 20s anymore. I, yeah. like I, I know exactly who and what I am and what matters to me. So did that change, do you think, when you gave birth to Finn? I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's part of it, but I think I was already quite a long way on that road. Okay, yeah. I think, you know, my, my 30s were the biggest kind of growth decade for me, yeah. completely. I mean, I think in my 20s, I was still running around pretending I was in my teens for a lot of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, on with their fingernails. <laughs> so when did you, um, when did you first realise that, or have you always known you were gay, and did that have like an, no, an, an, no. so that must have been, you didn't, but did you subconsciously know? Do you think? Um, I think plenty of people around me probably subconsciously yeah. knew, but I might have been the last to know. <laughs> so I, I didn't come out until my mid twenties. Um, Late. Yeah. Had you had girlfriends or anything before that? Were you um, too prepared to? No, no. I was no. My 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 um my first female partner was when I was in my my mid twenties. So I, yeah. yeah, I was quite late to it, and I'd I'd had boyfriends all through school and university and things like that. So um, and I, and I was one of those people that could sort of edged out in that. Yeah. You know, I, I fell for someone and, and did the whole well, I've fallen for the person, not the gender thing, and then yeah. you you know been on a road and and then realised that actually <laughs> who am I kidding? <laughs> Women are brilliant. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> So do I. I'm just women, women, strong women. All yep. my, all my best friends are strong, powerful women and gay men. But um, but yeah, do we've, you, we've got to have a couple of them around. Essentially, <laughs> do you think your um, Presbyterian background had? I mean, I don't know. I don't know much about that um, at all. But did that? I mean, how do they look at um, um, being gay and homosexuality are they kind of open-minded about it or did that have a impact on you coming out when you were in your yeah, I, mean, I think I think my faith and, and the church that I'm I'm in was part of the reason that I fought it for as long as I did okay that's um, and you know my my father's not religious my mum is mm. pretty religious and uh, I had was brought up in the church of Scotland and which which itself has come on a huge journey and, and is you know is, is so much better than it used to be mm. on issues like this um I, I still can't marry my wife or my fiance in my own church but we'll get there someday um, really but, i didn't yeah, know that. So, so church of scotland she's a she's irish so she's roman catholic so neither of us okay. can get married yeah. in church. Yeah. although when we got it was really sweet actually when we got engaged and it was in the paper uh, the scottish episcopal church which does carry out same-sex ceremonies we're within the week, we're emailing, bidding for the wedding. So, no. <laughs> kind. But we kind of thought, given that we're already a mixed marriage, we probably don't want to introduce a third sort of yeah. location <laughs> in there. So, um, so yeah, so that was quite funny. But, um, do you know, I, I think, you know, you, you read kind of what's there and Paul's letters to as many churches and all the rest of it. And when you're classed, classified al alongside idolaters and adulterers and all the rest of it. I mean, it, you do kind of take that on board, but mm. I, I think as well, the, the problem that we had particularly, I mean, I came out sort of 15 years more than that now. So things have changed a lot, but, but um, even then there was the sense that the Venn diagram, like Christians were on one side and gay yeah. people were on the other, and there was no crossover in the middle. And that's just not true. Yeah. Um, and it's, as hard to come out as a Christian in certain gay groups as it is to come out as being gay in, in, in some churches. Yeah. Um, but we have come, like, I mean, I cannot tell you how far we've come in, in the 15, 16 years since I came out. Mm. And have you had, I mean, were you quite active in that, in, in kind of getting the, the message out and, and, and trying to make it more acceptable within the church and within politics? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think in, in both. I mean, I was very active in my church. Like I say, I grew up in a, I, you know, I'm a former Sunday school teacher, although why anyone would let me be in charge of the spiritual guidance of eight-year-olds, I do not know. Um, um, and in terms of um, being open about sexuality, I mean, it, 
for me, just the way it was, um, it, it wasn't one of those ones where you, you kind of, you only come out to your friends, but not your family or anything like that. So I was, once I was out, I was, I was all the way out and then yeah. I started running for elections and things like that. So, yeah. you know, it was, it was the adjective that was always put in front of my name. So there was never kind of anything about it, but, but even in my job, one of the very early jobs I had at the BBC when I first started there, when I was like 21 or 22, was kind of booking guests for programmes. And it was always, right, okay, there's, there's some furore about a gay issue. Let's phone the Catholic Church and get them on on the other side. And, and would often kind of intervene with the producer or the editor to say, well, well look, this, you know, let, let's think a bit smarter here. It doesn't, mm. it doesn't always have to be an antagonistic relationship. Mm. Um, I didn't always win, but, you know, it was always worth trying because I just think it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were in your, um, before you came, were you at university before you came out? Yeah. So I went to uni at 17. Um, oh, that's the Scottish system and I, well, yeah, I'm, I'm this sort of younger half of my year in the Scottish system. Okay. Who hires and not A levels and, and six year studies. So I went off at 17 thinking that I knew everything about the world. I had a very rude awakening. Uh, mm. I went to Edinburgh Uni, which had a, a lot of people that had done A-levels, then gone off and done a gap year or two. A lot of posh tracks, yeah. Well, I, you know, I would never call them that, but there was, a lot, there was a lot of tassily loafers, a lot of gilets, uh, you know, a lot of people that had built orphanages in Tanzania. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and, and they just had this super sheen of confidence that, I couldn't match and, and they were loud and, and I, I guess the brashness of it was really difficult for a wee lassie from a wee village in Fife, you know. And, and did you retreat or did you then want to kind of fight against that? Did you want to kind of almost take it on? Because there's, there's that awful thing with, with you know, and, and I, I have quite a posh background and it's, it's that those questions like, the two questions which I hate more than fucking anything are where did you go to school and what what does your father do? Do you know, like I'd never ever had those questions until Freshers Week at university and people were like, which school do you go to? I was like, well, I don't think you'll ever have heard of it. Buckhaven yeah. High School, you know, uh, and I remember this one kind of thing that they do at Edinburgh where you like, at the end of Freshers Week, you climb this this big mountain called Arthur's Seat in the middle of the city and watch the sunrise and all this sort of thing. And I was up there doing that with hundreds of other freshers. And there was some chap with, you know, tasselly loafers and a signet ring on his pinky, you know, the type and the pink shirt. That's my son, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, like, I, I don't even know if this is true, but I just have this distinct memory of him going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, my father was captain of the ship that sunk the Belgrano. And I'm going... Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really boast about that, mate. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> or, or he was—he might not be in the captain, but he was like the executive officer or something like that. And I was just like, "What a fucking stupid thing!" <laughs> I'm like, "Really? We we're doing this at five a.m. pissed on a mountaintop, are we? Oh, all right then, mate. So, so yeah, I didn't bring him into my friends group. I think it's fair to say. <laughs> oh my god, that is just hilarious. Oh, Ruth, but but so then, I mean. <sighs> You, you, at that point, well, you'd suffered from depression. Let's bring it right down again. You suffered from depression before that. Was that when a friend of yours um, committed suicide? Was it in your village or? Yeah. So um, when I was, uh, so when I was at university, so at the, the tail end of my first year, um, I, I, I did, I, 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 I think that was the trigger. I, I, I've never really unpacked all of it, but um, I was run over when I was five. I really, really badly um, injured. Um, broke my leg, fractured my pelvis, severed the main artery in my my leg. Um, had that all crushed, uh, severed the, the nerve in the front of my leg, and I was in hospital for for weeks and weeks and weeks. And they had to save me first, and then they had to save the leg. So that's one of the reasons I kind of walk a bit funny is is because I was a bit mangled because I was hit by a truck. Um, yeah. So I had a really, really long kind of road to rehab. Um, and, and it so happens that a boy that, that was a bit older than me that lived across the road from me was run over on the same stretch of road. Um, a few years after I was, uh, he, he wasn't as badly injured as me. And I, I was having quite a torrid time at university and um, anyway. Uh, and then it, it, I don't know whether his suicide was the trigger or whether it just happened to be an unfortunate confluence of events. But I, I really, really struggled with the idea that I had lived and he hadn't. And there was a real kind of weird survivor's guilt about it. And the, the thing that's, that's really odd 
is that, that Martin and I, we weren't that close. You know, we weren't best mates. We didn't go out to the pub together. Like, it was a small village, so everybody knew each other. His dad had been my clarinet teacher at primary school, you know what I mean? And, like, and I'd washed pots in the golf club that he'd been a member of and, and things like that. But um, the, some of my friends were much closer friends to him and, and weren't affected in the same way. But, it, but for whatever reason, it, I, I really struggled. And um, at that time, like I say, this is, this is a long time ago, this would be sort of 17, 18 years ago. Yeah. Um, maybe long, oh goodness, this might be, oh no, 21 oh, no. years ago. No. Oh dear, I'm so older than I thought. <laughs> really well, let, me work, let me work this out. This was in 1997, at the start of 97. This is 23 years ago. So, so yeah, okay, 23, oh ago, yeah. goodness, how old am I? Anyway, so 23 years ago, um, the way in which university health centres at that time dealt with it was they just threw some pills at you, basically. Yeah. Um, and I had a really bad reaction to the pills, but I didn't know that that's what it was. So I kept going back going, you know, things are worse, not better. So they just kept going, right, well, we'll just double your dose until I got onto the maximum you could be on. And I have to be really careful about how I say this because the company that makes the particular brand that I was on is quite litigious. Um, but there has been a number of class actions around the world regarding side effects for this particular brand of, of, of antidepressant, which particularly in adolescents uh, and young adults, one of its side effects is <laughs> increased suicidal thoughts and tendencies, which I would suggest is not brilliant for an antidepressant. Uh, so, um, so yes, I, yeah. I, so I, I, I had sort of two or three years that were, were pretty, pretty dark and pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, and then sort of graduated and, and started putting myself back together again. And so do you think you've, I mean, did you have, have you, so you've chucked away the pills, I assume, and did you, have you ever kind of, because I've, I've, I've been down that road too, and um, my mum was severely uh, bipolar, manic depressive, and trying to commit suicide every five minutes. Um, so I'm kind of very aware of that and very conscious of it, and I'm always looking out for it in my kids, because apparently it can skip a generation. Hmm. Um, but have you, and then, and then I was, I was fine for a long time. I had a lot when I was a child and I thought it, I, I thought it was homesickness because I was sent away to boarding school and I was miserable. So I didn't really in an anxiety and fear, but it was depression. And, um, and since then, and, and then I was fine. But then when I had my first, um, my, my first child, I got postnatal depression, which I didn't know what it was. And I had it for eight years, all through all pregnancy just thinking, okay, well, this is how, how people feel. You know, this is how I, what I'm feeling is normal. And um, so have you managed to put it behind you or do you think you have a propensity? Well, I, I kind of, I'm one of the people that's of the view that it's not something that you have and then don't have. It's not something yeah. that you can fix. It's something there. that you manage. Yeah. It's something that's, that's, that's kind of always there and that you, yeah. you manage it and you have to kind of, be aware of when things could be difficult and put in mm. places your own coping mechanisms for it. So, so something like the start of lockdown, the idea of not having necessarily a routine, not having the freedom to exercise. Um, if you're not getting up for, for work at the same time every day, you could do that thing that yeah. I, I certainly used to do when I, when I was a student, which was become nocturnal, like your sleeping habits change, that sort yeah. of thing. So, so I was really super on it and cut down on my drinking God, that makes me sound like a drinker. I don't, but I mean, I, I almost yeah. cut alcohol completely out of what I was doing. Uh, I made sure I went to bed at the same time every night. Um, it turns out that all the hundreds of pounds I've been spending every year on gym fees and uh, personal trainers, I didn't need to. All I needed was the government to tell me, you're not allowed to exercise more than once a day. And I was mad for the exercise. Couldn't get me out of my trainers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so I was really on that, made sure I did loads of that, started doing other kind of control measures as well uh, and just made sure that I managed this period just because I'm I'm so scared of ever going back to where I was when I was yeah. sort of 18 19 20 because it was such a dark time that that is my biggest fear is that I ever go back there yeah. and so there have been times where uh, you know I've, I've been at risk um where I've, I've had to work really hard to keep my head above water um, mm. when I was 25 I broke my back in quite a bad injury when I was in the oh my God, Ruth, the, you're how oh, you I, <laughs> I, I jumped head first through a window frame on command and landed badly. Um, 
which you know I have a really cavalier attitude to personal safety so yeah, um, I'm a bit the same yes yeah so um so that was a that was a period where I knew I could be in a bit of trouble and, and I once I got out of hospital and they, they'd given me this kind of back brace and stuff I'd been signed off my work for three months mm. and I, I begged my GP to write me a letter to say that I could go in and then and then I went into my work and I badgered I, I just kept going up the line to boss to boss to boss saying no no you don't understand I have to come into work I have to work mm. I cannot sit at home watching Homes Under the Hammer for three mm. months because it will rot my brain quicker than heroin and, yeah. you know, and, and I was more frightened of going into a, a, a bad place that I never want to return to yeah. and I was of perhaps not fully healing my back or having future back pain because in terms of the payoff one was sick was of a magnitude of difference to the other yeah. to, to me to me yeah but do you think that's I mean that whole god we're not really talking about clothes much are we we'll get back there but I've got I've got, I've got something here to show you which is my biggest fail so we, yeah it's like that thing so I, I really identify you know I empathize and identify and it's kind of like, um, but by, by doing that and keeping busy, and yes, it's one of our coping me mechanisms. So I'm saying I find exercise, and if I feel, you know, I get that kind of cloud descending, I'll keep busy, I'll go for a run, I'll do da da da, -da. But sometimes I wonder that, should I just sit down with it? Am I running, is it running away from it? Is it, you know, should one just sit down and, and absorb it and try and analyze it in you know, yeah, I think sometimes making peace but I guess it's you know it can be a well it's a chemical imbalance very often isn't it I, I think I would never suggest that the way I I sort of fought myself out of this way way back 20 some years ago when I discovered is the way that is right for everybody it's just the way that was right for me yeah, yeah. and I think that there are people for whom it is better for them to take the time to to breathe to slow down to mm. absorb it and then to work their way through it now the problem that i have is i find that i fall further or at least i'm scared that i would fall further and it would be harder to fight my way back out yeah. so i would rather try and outrun it than yeah. to sit still and let it consume me and all of the other things that go along with that and the way in which other people are affected in your life yeah absolutely because there's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not single yeah. anymore. I have family responsibilities. It's a responsibility. I, Your mental not, health exactly is a responsibility, not just for yourself, but for exactly. other people. I, I, well, I feel that it's a responsibility for the people around me. You know, I, I'm the main breadwinner for my family. I've got to, you know, I've, there's, there's things that I've got to do. There are responsibilities mm. that I have that, that I, I can't step out of, mm. nor would I ever want to. And because that in itself would, would, would I think be damaging for, for me and the way in which... Uh, I, I kind of work through things. So for me, and I'm, you know, I'm really clear that, that people deal with this better differently uh, and in their own situation. But for me and for my situation, I, I believe it is better when I have it. And, and to be fair, you know, I've, I've, I've done really well in the last few years in quite a high stress job. And I was worried when I took the job that, you know, that, that could be an issue, but I, I've, I've done all right. I think mm. um, for me, it is better to stave it off than to, mm. to sit absorb and then come out the other side is that why you didn't um because we were all screaming for you to um stand for prime minister come on ruth is that <laughs> why you chose not to do that because well, well, that's a very that's a very easy question on the grounds that i couldn't because i'm not an mp in the rule state you have to be so you know i was sitting in a holy so so even if i had wanted to and i've been very clear you know um i have seen the job from the other side of the door at number 10 i've been very privileged yeah. to be and watch prime ministers at work and it is possibly the loneliest job in the world um and it's not just about valuing my own mental health uh, which i do uh, and I put a value on it, but it's also about valuing the the family that I've built here. Mm. I mean, I, I the intolerable pressure mm. that you know, living in a gilded cage is still a cage, and it might be a cage that you choose, but it's not a cage that your family chooses. So mm. I, I think that you know, even in the the very small sort of corner of of the the sphere of politics and scrutiny and kind of the Scottish press at you that I've been in, you know, the sacrifices that people in my life have had to make when it wasn't the job they chose yeah. you know I, I do have a responsibility to to look after them too mm. 
Yeah, I, I hear you totally. But yeah, it's a shame for all of us. But, um, but Ruth, and you, what's your greatest insecurity? What's your big kind of like physical insecurity? Um, I don't like being frightened of things. Okay. I really hate that. Yeah. So I sometimes force myself to do things that I know I shouldn't in order to not be scared of them. Like what? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> like, like running to be the leader of a political party when you've been in the job three minutes. Like that's that's <laughs> quite a big thing. <laughs> but, um, that's but also, so true. It's kind of again. I mean, I just I totally. But, but, uh, I'm the same. Also, like failing in public. I mean, you know, we, in a different eye. We're in the public yeah. eye in a different way. But like rules. you know, you kind of want to be private when you have when you mess up yeah. uh, you don't want it to be across all the newspapers you don't want people to be laughing at you or shouting at you and and yeah. politics because it's so adversarial you've got you know your own little team that sit in a parliament beside you some of whom are you know desperate for your job and would quite happily see you fail and work towards that um but mostly are on your side and then you've got everybody else in the parliament whose job it is to make you fail <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, because they only get more votes if you get less votes. So yeah. you, you know, it's it, it. I guess and 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 doing something like becoming leader within six months of becoming a professional politician means that you fail in public a lot because you've got to learn. Mm. Um, and and I I don't like being bad at things and I don't like letting people down and I've always found that not letting people down is a much stronger driver than you know trying to make people proud of you or trying to impress people or whatever that that doesn't actually interest in me mm. but not letting people down that that's the most important thing mm. and were you criticized a lot for your appearance appearance were you did the media give you a hard time um your appearance I, mean, or I, think, I mean like like i say i mean a, a lot of that is is weight related rather than what i wear um, and also, you know, I've got a really round face. I've got very narrow eyes. Like I'm, I'm quite easy to lampoon. So, yeah. so which is fine. I mean, yeah, but, yeah. You know, to, and to be fair, I, I kind of, I bring quite a bit of it on myself. I, I have, I once accepted an, an award, a political award show, which are terrible. I don't know why they give politicians awards. It's awful. It's like just the most cringeworthy thing ever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I once accepted an award saying that it was a brilliant day because not only was I winning this, but earlier that night, I'd also come second in a Kim Jong-un lookalike competition. So, you know, it's kind of my own fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just, you know what? It's kind of like, I, I think you just got to celebrate what people criticise you for at the end. And then, you, and then you can get through anything. Well, also, do you know, I have... A partner who loves me I've got a fantastic little boy I've got a close family yeah what other people that don't know you say about you it, it turns out it doesn't matter doesn't matter yeah and it you can have all the Twitter pitchforks and mobs yeah. and you know the ones that do cut through the ones that do hurt are actually people that you have met or yeah. you've I've come into your orbit at some point and and you think wait a minute that's one what you're saying is not fair and two you should know better than that so, yeah. so they're the ones that get to you and they're, they're very occasional but um, but just like the fifty-five-year-old men that are still living in their mum's basements that are tweeting in their underpants, like water off a dog's back. Like yeah. you don't, you you literally do not ma matter to what I'm trying to achieve for my family and me and my happiness and my work achievements. Like yeah. you, you know that should you if if that is getting through any armor that I have, mm. then that's my problem, not mm. theirs. Yeah, no, that's so true, and it's kind of like what what other people. I, I always feel that what other people think of me is none of my business. I always say that to myself. It's just none of my business. I don't know them. It's none of my business. Also, the idea that somebody is spending time thinking about you, it's really sad. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm not spending time thinking about them. <laughs> I'm trying to get stuff done. <laughs> <laughs>